You know, the first time I ever heard about you was from Joey Ramone. Oh, really? It would be 98, 99, and Joey and I were talking about doing something, and he was all over this band called Degeneration. And he had nothing but props to say about you and, 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 and the band back then. Um, was How long would that, that... How did that relationship come about? I guess he came, we played in New York City a lot at a little club before we got our record deal at a place called the Continental on 3rd Avenue in St. Mark's and Joey lived across the street so he would come down to the shows and you know then one day we were playing a bigger room at the Webster Hall and he came and introduced us on Halloween and we were just so excited because you know, I'm from Queens and most everybody in D-Generation was from New York and Queens, New York and worshipped the Ramones. So that led from, I guess, Daniel Ray producing our first record who had produced some Ramones records, Pet Cemetery and Adios Amigos and and then uh, we went on tour with them. We went out with them on their tour, which was Mono Bizarro, I guess. And it was one of our first times, like, getting on the road and learning, you know, just how you do it. You know, just how to be out, how each thing works, hotels, how to get free stuff, how to, you know, the sound checks, everything. And they were great. And Joey would ride on our bus because at that time they weren't really talking. They couldn't stand each other. And <laughs> he said, can I come on the bus? And so we would just take over towns. If the Ramones had an off day, D-Generation booked a gig and... Joey would come and sing with us and sing any song that the Ramones wouldn't do. And we stayed friends for a lot of years. And uh, there's a lot of people you meet you know, in music that love you know, the money or the drugs or the sex. And, and Joey was really a pretty pure guy, just really loved rock and roll. It was, that was his MO, really. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a big loss, but those records still hold up better than anything. They sure do. Uh, so now we have. Um uh, Jesse Mellon and St. Mark's Social, for anybody who doesn't know, explain what St. Mark's is. Because you, you have to go to New York, you have to hang out in St. Mark's. Yeah, it's a street it where um, a lot of things happen. There's a Gem Spa, Egg Cream magazine store in the corner where the New York Dolls took that photograph in the back of their record. There's bookstores. It's kind of the, you know, edge of your part of town at one point. Now it's been gentrified. I think we have a Quiznos there probably now. But it, it's just a street that leads down to the east side of, of downtown New York where the park is and a lot of the bars and the rehearsal room that we have and where we hung out and stuff, kind of where I grew up. Once I got out of the suburbs, I needed a place to go where I could dress differently and think differently and find the records I wanted, and that was kind of our church. So, That's, um, um, That whole area, there's something called the Punk Rock Walk oh, yeah. that you can take. It's a guided walking tour, and you start at Joy Ramone's apartment building. You end up and then you end up at where CBGB's was. And it's actually... <laughs> John Favreau's story, man. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's actually Still a pretty, pretty cool walk. And you go up and down, uh, you go up and down uh, uh, St. Mark's, and you know, here's the houses, the holy building, here's where Keith and Mick did uh, Waiting, Waiting on, on a Friend, friend yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think Lenny Bruce lived at 13 St. Mark's. I just found out, like, there's a little book I got before I left town at all the rock and roll spots. I know some of them, but then there's always something you learn. But yeah, it's just a, a, a name of some kind of social club. The band itself was something I wanted to make that had something more rhythmic, more rocking, a little different than my songwriter records that I'd made previously. And it's an open door of some friends getting together, and, and that's how the band kind of evolved into being more of a group as opposed to just uh, the solo bit. Now, New York has always had a, a scene there, but it ebbs and flows with whatever's happening. I mean, uh, it's been a long time since there was uh, a recognized, how do I put this, uh, a rock scene that is seen as a scene by the outside world. Yeah, I think I'd have to really hand it to the Strokes because uh, before that there weren't really any rock bands since Blondie and the Ramones that broke. I mean, Sonic Youth, it's kind of questionable they're a rock band, but they're kind of on the edge of something else. And then there's the Beastie Boys, which that kind of crosses into things. So the Strokes and then Yeah, Yeah, as an Interpol, I think that, that kind of, the Strokes kicked the doors open, you know, where we got rid of that, where New York got respect in the world and as a, a rock and roll, you know, guitars and... A lot came after that. Yeah, know, and there's a lot goes. happening in Brooklyn right now. I mean, we're hearing about all these these bands coming out of Brooklyn, and you know, you know, there's even from the the, the bridge and tunnel crowd, like the you know, we're getting the uh, uh, Gaslight Anthem, yeah, and Hold Steady, great. and and you guys, and it's all this 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 sort of I don't want to use the word anthemic, but it's it's this big songs. 
Yeah, I think it's like people, like some of the bands you listed that really grew up with maybe more of a similar record collection than I have, you know, replacements to Clash, and then suddenly there's Springsteen thrown in, and then, you know, whatever, you go into some different areas. But I think people are, are realizing that songs are important, and it's not just about, you know, being so arty or being so weird, or, you know, a lot of things get recreated over and over again, but I think good songs are something that'll always just stay, and it's everybody's take on it, you know, mixing the ingredients up and spitting it out in your own way. So, but uh, I like getting out of New York a lot. I mean, I like going back there. It's a good home base, but I like seeing the world, you know, with, you know, the band and with the songs. So, so the album's Love It to Life. It's yeah. uh, nice and short, 10, right, ten songs. <laughs> um, no fat, which is uh, a Ramones lesson right there. It's like the records, because we do it on vinyl, too. It's like the records you had as a kid where it was, you know, five and five, just 34 minutes, pretty short and sweet. So. And the, the first song is Burning the Bowery. Um, now... That's one of those big songs that I'm talking about with you know the big chorus kind of thing. Right. Um, what about what do you mean burning the Bowery? Well, to me, Bowery is a historic place in New York. And as a kid, I found myself after I landed on St. Mark's Place, going to CBGBs and playing in my early teens in hardcore bands. And it was matinees there, and it was the history of that. But previous to that, it was known worldwide as a Skid Row, as a place for people that were you know down and out would come to the Bowery. Uh, it has history as the largest Indian trail uh, before that in New York City. And it was this place where people kind of dropped out of society and rebuilt themselves. And I came back from touring for a few years. I noticed that the whole country was pretty much, you know, the world was falling apart economically. People were freaked out and, you know, know what's going on. And I found myself, like, off the road, like, I don't know, should I continue to make records? What should I do? Should I become a comedian or maybe a gynecologist? Or So um, I found myself back on the Bowery, right there looking around with Whole Foods and Subway and all these things and galleries and then all these poor people. And you know, I think it's about the process of burning things down to rebuild them, the mm -hmm. Phoenix Act. And it doesn't have to be so much the Bowery in New York. It could be anywhere in your town that you want to knock things over to rebuild them and, and find that beauty again, the what new about, day. What about a song like Disco Ghetto? Disco Ghetto is... Uh, Something that happened during those hard times when I was really broke. I ended up at this party, and I was like one of the few white people there. And they were all playing all the 70s soul and disco, and I was with this girl. And it was always people that were so messed up, but like you could tell nobody was going to go to work. Nobody had a job, but they were having the best time of their life. And that's an old thing of you know music being a celebration, and no matter what your money is. or It's like laughing. you know. Everyone needs some kind of release, and I, I'd be really happy to have music. It's always been my drug. And my escape and my way out and I think a lot of people share that so it's interesting that you've been in bands since you were 13 years old and a lot of people would say okay you've been doing the rock and roll thing for that long you know you can't you know no portable skills but you actually do you've got two rest two bars in a restaurant um, a couple things like that I'm involved in yeah it's kind of like a mafia thing I wanted a place to get free drinks and um, you know me and a few friends took some publishing money early on we opened a place called Coney Island High and that was on St. Mark's Place. And uh, that you got know what? closed. I've, I've been to Coney uh, Island High. Yeah. yeah, the Ramones played. Yeah. But um, it got closed for dancing in the height of the Giuliani quality of life era of the 90s when everybody was getting arrested. And then I put a little bar together called Niagara on the park with Johnny T. It was, uh, Johnny T's a drummer for Ryan Adams and The Finger. And we wanted like a clubhouse. Is so, that near yeah. Dick Manitoba's place? It's a block away from Manitoba's bar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, it's like in Raging Bull, like Jake LaMotta. Like, yeah, I'm opening a place. What are you going to call it? Manitobas. No. Um, but we always had a policy that the bands could drink free and they could come there and have a good time. Oh, no, there's DJ. a business plan. Yeah, well, <laughs> when I go on tour, I want to go to the place that has, you know, a great jukebox or a great DJ or, you know, some great music piped in on an iPod or whatever, toothbrush, a little, and hear great songs and, and get free drinks and, and talk to some girls. And, and uh, we try to give that same thing as a service, whether you're in... Uh, some emo band or you're in some fucking death metal, you know, whatever, whatever, everything in between. And Sinatra tributes too. You got the Pizza Place? Uh, pizza Place went out of business. Punk Rock Pizza Place was, uh, was an idea, but uh, that's done. Yeah, we had a Pizza Place, but, you know, pizza's important too. That'd be my electric chair meal, so, you know. I don't like Domino's so much, so. Kid comes up to you and he says, we like what you're doing. I want to be a rock and roll guy too. What record should I have? Give me five. Okay, London Calling by The Clash, mm. Ramones Rocket to Russia, ooh, um, rock and roll guy. <laughs> oh, boy. Chuck Berry, The Great 28, Wilco, Yankee Hotel Foxtrot, and, um, oh, I don't know. 
Let's see. Exile on Main Street by the Rolling Stones. Pretty solid foundation for anybody. Yeah, Mojo Ooh. Magazine favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll be on the cover. Each one of those will be on the cover. Five the, times a five year. Five times a year, <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what about, what are you listening to now? Um, the new Hold Steady I'm listening to. I like The Kills a lot. The Big Pink. Um, That's a good record. I wish more people would know about The Big Pink. Yeah, it seems like they're spreading. I mean, they did some good shows you know, in New York. Some kids were talking about them in Montreal. Big hip-hop fans, those guys. Yeah, you could hear that. Isn't it Danny Cordell's son who produced Tom Petty? I think so. Everyone's got kids, you know, and their kids are famous. And somebody from Rolling Stone's kids taking the photo right now. And, but um, I'd say there's a lot of stuff. The new Gogo Bordello record, what I've heard live, sounds really cool. And the new Gaslight Anthem. So uh, some things like that. Well, good luck with the record. I like it a lot. Um, again, it's that those, I keep coming back to that idea of big songs. Uh -huh. uh, that, that, that grab people by the scruff of the neck and give them a little bit of a shake. Cool. And uh, let's uh, see what we can do with this record for you. Great. Thank uh, you. All right, thank you.